Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Maintaining Business Continuity at the Busiest Foreign Seaport in the U.S. I'm Michelle Lowther with Continuity Housing and we provide housing for your critical personnel when you need it most. Today's webinar will focus on maintaining business continuity and overall operations in the Port of Houston, which handles 65% of all major U.S. project cargo and is a major hub of activity that's responsible for generating more than 1.2 million jobs throughout Southeast Texas. Today's webinar will cover how the Port of Houston prepares for and overcomes a wildly diverse range of challenges to its 24-7 continuity of operations. These include potential issues arising from fire, explosions, medical assistance and transports, aviation, ecological concerns, legalities, dealing with international personnel, collisions both on and offshore, spills, leaks, the possibility of terrorism, and of course inclement or destructive weather. They even have contingencies for multiple but different types of events occurring at the same time. Our presenter today is Captain Marcus Woodring, a 26-year veteran of the US, U.S. Coast Guard and Managing Director of the Port's HSSE branch. That includes the Port of Houston firefighters and hazmat response teams, the Port Police Department with 53 sworn officers and six port security officers, the Safety Department with four specialists, all administrative and budgeting functions, three facility security officers, and an emergency manager supervising eight dispatchers. Captain Woodring obtained his Master of Public Administration from Cornell University and a Bachelor of Arts in Geology and Earth Science from Brown University. He's also a Certified Emergency Manager under the International Association of Emergency Managers and is also a Texas Emergency Manager under the Emergency Management Association of Texas. And perhaps most importantly, I just found out this morning, he is a brand new grandfather with a three-day-old granddaughter. Congratulations, Captain, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, obviously, that's the biggest thing going on in my life right now, if you ask my wife especially. But uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us today, and, and thank you to Michelle and Fred for inviting me to do this. This is the first uh, webinar that I've ever presented. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, usually when I speak in public, I'm very interactive and like to ask questions. So if you hear me ask a question and then answer it myself, you'll know why. <laughs> um, but today we're going to talk about some maritime case studies. Uh, I'm going to mix some of the U.S. Coast Guard experience I have. I spent about 30, well, almost 30 years in the Coast Guard, uh, along with some incidents that have occurred since I've been here at the Port of Houston Authority but uh, they'll all revolve around Houston. So to set the stage, uh, I really needed to explain to you the difference between the Port of Houston and the Port of Houston Authority. The Port of Houston is a 52 nautical mile ship channel that runs from the Gulf of Mexico up into almost downtown Houston. And along that stretch of waterway, there's about 150 facilities or terminals that operate, most are privately held. You can see here on this slide, we have a graphic, uh, the yellow line, and, and I squiggled it in there so it's not exactly perfect, but uh, shows the ship channel as it comes from the sea buoy offshore, past Galveston, past Texas City, and up into Houston. Now the Port of Houston Authority that I work for is a subset of that greater Port of Houston. I occasionally go to conferences and people say, oh my goodness, you're in charge of security for all of the Port of Houston. And I say, no, 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 time out. Just eight of those 150 terminals fall under my purview. And those eight terminals are depicted here. You can see we have two big container ports, Bayport and Barber's Cut. In the middle we have three terminals that actually are almost wholly leased. And then on the left-hand side or western uh, part of the slide, we have three more terminals. My daily job is to make sure that these terminals are safe and secure. Um, in the broader picture, the Port of Houston Authority, as the governmental entity in Houston, does provide some services on behalf of everybody. And those include things like overseeing the Houston pilots, uh, providing fireboat coverage for all the terminals up and down the channel so not everybody has to have a fireboat. Um, and dredging to make sure that the channel remains dredged on behalf of everybody. So we are kind of, uh, depending on which part of the day it is, I may spin my hat around and be Port of Houston, or I may be Port of Houston Authority, but primarily I'm Port of Houston Authority. 
So again, to set the stage for what we're going to talk about today, uh, we want to make sure that the economic importance is driven home. Why is Houston important? Why, why do all these things matter in the big picture? Um, you can see almost $500 billion, and this is uh, national economic statistics here, which breaks down to about $57 million an hour, and if there's 60 minutes in an hour, my rough math says that's a million dollars a minute. And that's a heck of a lot more than I earn in a year. Um, so every minute the ship channel is providing a million dollars of economic impact, which is incredible to me. 2.1 million jobs, uh, either directly or indirectly, and nationally are, are really rooted in the activity along the ship channel. And then you can see some of those other uh, statistics there. We are the second largest petrochemical complex on the planet. Um, and again, this is where I would ask a question if I was with a live audience. Uh, does anybody know what the first one is? And the guess is always in the Middle East, uh, but the actual answer is Rotterdam. Um, which produces the gasoline and the fuel products and petrochemicals for all of Europe. So that's actually number one, and I understand in the next few years with our expansion, uh, we may actually overtake them. All right, so now that I've kind of outlined the economic importance and why this matters here in Houston, um, we're going to talk about three different, well, actually four cases today, but in three categories, safety, things like ship collisions uh, or elisions, and an elision is when you hit a stationary object. Uh, I actually have two security events. I added one after uh, doing a practice with uh, Fred the other day, and then I have one uh, example of a stewardship event, which includes oil spill response. So let's get started. Um, what a great name. The towing vessel Safety Quest had a safety accident. Uh, you can see the front page of the Houston Chronicle there from 2010. The safety quest was outbound from Houston pushing three loaded barges of scrap metal. And it's about 6 o'clock in the morning, and the captain uh, on the safety quest is actually on his computer typing up a report to send back to his headquarters. And in order to do that, he's not watching where he's going. The result was uh, he hit a power line tower, one of four that crosses the Houston Ship Channel. Fortunately, the one he hit was the one that was de-energized that day. So I didn't have a problem with electricity at that very moment. Uh, but again, taking down one of those four power lines that crosses the Ship Channel was an issue. And it was such an issue, based on the economic impact, that this is a uh, snapshot of a DHS alert that was sent out. The National Operations Center is there are big events that occur around the country uh, with electrical outages, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. They'll send out a little snapshot to a, uh, a tight list there in D.C. to let them know what's going on. And this one actually made that list. You can see the barge here. Uh, you can see the pilot house. The captain was facing aft working on his computer at 6 a.m. as he came down the ship channel and plowed right into that power line tower. You might notice in this picture there are some bollards or those concrete things kind of around the tower. Um, and the question is, how do you get past those going southbound? Uh, apparently the tower got moved at one point, and those protected or encircled the tower uh, at the time that they were put in. But when they moved the tower, and the approach from the north where the tugboat came from actually had no bollards in the way. So that was a problem. Um, no protection for it, and he ran right into it. As you get closer, you can see that it's an incredible mess. Uh, very fortunate the tower didn't go over, being held up by the power lines that were there. And as you got closer, it was just a mangled mess. So my, my question or moral of the story here, and, and we'll circle back to all these, but what I want you to think about in this particular case is what is your process? How do your processes impact safety, security, stewardship? Do you have a good process, or does your process include the captain of the vessel, who should be looking forward, typing a report to you at 6 a.m. to give you some data that you may or may not want or even use that day? Um, he could have had another crewman up there. Are you staffed properly to do the things that you've required of the people to do? All right, now we'll move on to security, and this is the area where I have actually uh, two little vignettes for you. This one's a stowaway, and again, very ironically, 
uh, kind of like the name of the safety quest, we get a call on April 1st. Well, April 1st happens to be April Fool's Day, and the CDC calls our command center at the Coast Guard base here in Houston and says we have a stowaway on board a vessel headed for Houston and has just departed Africa. So being the good watch standards, they say, all right, well, you know, can, can you give us the nationality of the uh, stowaway and uh, explain to us what the concerns of the CDC are? At which point we found out the stowaway was a monkey. Uh, and he's been out on the vessel roaming around, and, and the crew sees him maybe two, three days out of port, and they got a couple more weeks to get to Houston. And the CDC is concerned that this monkey may have some kind of infectious disease. On April 11th, about 10 days into the trip, uh, the crew was able to capture the monkey using some fruit as bait. Obviously, he got hungry. There, there wasn't a lot to eat out there on the deck of the ship. Uh, other than maybe the occasional flying fish that, that ended up on board, but monkeys don't eat flying fish. So they used a little bit of fruit, got him in a crate, and uh, as you can see, doesn't look very happy. So on April 13th, we asked the ship to stop at Anchorage, or, or actually ordered it to stop at Anchorage using uh, the authority of the U.S. Coast Guard, and we sent out a joint boarding team. This team consisted uh, of CBP officers. You see two of them there on the left. Uh, representative from the CDC there in the center, and a U.S. Public Health Service doctor there on the right. And this team went out, went on board the vessel, very different from, from what we're used to, uh, combating terrorism or doing search and rescue. This was more of a medical situation. The Public Health Service officer came fully prepared with oranges to feed the monkey, uh, and obviously outfitted with a mask there uh, because of the concerns of the CDC. So the official mugshot for the monkey getting ready to enter the U.S. and he was brought on, on shore on uh, April 14th. The end of the story is actually when they got him into quarantine and they did check him out, he did have some diseases and uh, they did have to put Mr. Monkey down. So uh, we felt bad about that, but we also felt good that uh, we were able to resolve the situation. And we'll come back to the moral of this story after I give you the second vignette uh, for security, and that's Occupy Houston. Very interesting. Uh, you can see the flyer. It says, show the 1% that we are the source of their wealth. Well, as you can imagine, at a terminal or, or along the waterfront, we have a lot of truck drivers, a lot of electricians, a lot of longshoremen. Uh, they are probably the 99%. But Occupy Houston put out a flyer, and in support of their uh, West Coast brethren, they were going to occupy the port and they gave us a date and time and location and everything. So off we went, and we were prepared. We called all our partners, uh, Harris County Sheriff's Office, Houston Police Department, Customs and Border Protection, Houston Fire Department brought ambulances, the Port of Houston Authority. We had everybody on scene ready to respond. So here they come. The protesters show up uh, outside our main gate, and you can see almost everybody has a camera. It's almost more of a, a event. Uh, media event than it is a protest. Um, the funny part about it was there were cars that were like pulling up um, with like a mom in them and like three kids would jump out in their early 20s and say, okay mom, pick us up in an hour and mom would drive off. And, I, and I'm just stunned by this. I'm standing there watching this just thinking to myself, wow, so protest today, have your mom drop you off and they come back and pick you up later. And you can see we have, we have twins down there in the front right um, there with mustaches and little beards. But again, TV cameras, more people assembling to protest. Once the protest started, uh, a group of people walked up onto the road that leads into the Port of Houston Authority and uh, sat down in the road and chained themselves together. These are called sleeping dragons, and basically that's a piece of PVC pipe with like a bolt in the middle and they reach in there and they handcuff themselves to the bolt or handcuff themselves to each other so that you can't get to the handcuffs and you can't take them apart because the PVC pipe's covering it. So they lay down in the road or they hook themselves together like this and uh, block traffic. Well, one of our partners, Houston Fire Department, had an inflatable tent and the tent was great because they uh, were able to bring it over and place it over the protesters and you can see we could work inside the tent on cutting the PVC pipe and then cutting the handcuffs apart and things like that um, out of view of the public. 
what this did though is the people that were there that weren't chained together but standing around watching the whole thing um, one they were accusing us of torturing and abusing the people inside the tent because obviously the the protester that's inside the tent is screaming like a banshee uh, trying to get some attention and then somebody actually suggested that we were we were poisoning them we were gassing them inside the tent and that's why we put the tent over the top of them um, obviously not taking into account that the police officers and the firemen were in there with them um, but a lot of accusations and a lot of things but it was a very good tool for keeping prying eyes away from what the police and firemen were doing therefore not spurring any more uh, consternation on the part of the protesters. Once we got them cut uh, out of the sleeping dragons, uh, the Houston Police Department was able to lead them away and uh, take them into custody. So at the end of the day, the Houston Chronicle uh, obviously was on scene. They, they interviewed several people, including myself. And my quote, and, and the jobs are a little bit different, the numbers were different at the time, but uh, I, I basically said we were disappointed. Again, we were the 99% down here. A lot of these people are union workers, truck drivers, day laborers, and small businesses. So my point for you, uh, kind of like with the safety quest story about what is your process, the moral of the story here, the question I have for you to consider today in both the case with the monkey and the case with Occupy Houston is, do you know your partners? Um, we didn't deal as a Coast Guard with the medical and the CDC people very much, and so that was an eye-opener for us. Here at the Port of Houston Authority, we do deal with uh, the Houston Police Department and Harris County Sheriff's Office on a more regular basis, but there were a lot of people out there um, that we had to coordinate with, and it was a great exercise for us, but do you know your partners? No matter what happens, do you know who to call? Do you have them in your Rolodex or in your speed dial? All right, here's one of my favorites. This is, falls into the stewardship category. We, uh, we had an oil spill, and obviously I didn't have a contingency plan on my shelf for a monkey on a ship um, or power lines draped over the Houston ship channel, but uh, I did have a plan for an oil spill, and I'm like, okay, an oil spill. I finally have something I've got a plan for. Um, 250,000 gallons of hydronated tallow fatty acid and for the ladies out there um, well first of all does anybody know what tallow fatty acid is and you'll see some pictures of it coming up but it's basically animal fat it's used to make bars of soap candles and most importantly it's used as a moisturizer in women's cosmetics and, and women you won't thank me for that later after you see this but uh, that's what it's used for and so when the fatty acid spills in the water, I'm like, okay, oil spill, vacuum trucks, that's what I need, boom, I can do this. Here's the tank that contained the 250,000 gallons. They had a workman, and he was supposed to go out that day to the tank farm and unbolt the hatch cover for the empty tank. And his job was to go into the empty tank and inspect it to make sure it was good to go. Obviously, he got the wrong tank, and he got about half the bolts unbolted there uh, before the door flew open, sent him flying, and out came 250,000 gallons of uh, animal fat. You can see it ran down over the hill uh, into the roadway that was adjacent to it, and eventually got into the storm drains and ended up in the water, and that's where I became involved as the U.S. Coast Guard. The street that night uh, covered in, in animal fat, just everywhere and obviously we had to clean that up as well uh, or the company that was responsible had to clean that up. I certainly wasn't going to do that as the U.S. Coast Guard. I was more concerned about the water. So here ladies, uh, here's an example of uh, what, what you find in your cosmetics. Not a very uh, appetizing picture there and, and don't want to make fun of you because I probably use it uh, in my sunscreen and other things as well. Mm. So now here we go. It hits the water. And when it hits the water, it kind of congealed or, or turned into what I call mini icebergs. It looks like ice flows, um, again, made or designed to make candles or bars of soap. And that's almost exactly what it turned into was bars of soap as it was floating on the water. So far, my plan's working great. 
I've got uh, I've got boom. It's floating on the surface. I'm able to corral it, um, get it all in one spot, and now I'm getting ready to call the vacuum trucks and the skimmers and things to come come pick it up. Unfortunately, you can't suck up bars of soap or animal fat in a vacuum truck. It just it, it's more for liquid or viscous items than it is for uh, chunks of stuff. So what becomes the best tool we have? A pitchfork. I can tell you a pitchfork was not in my oil spill response plant. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be using a pitchfork in an oil spill. But the responders were able to use the pitchfork very easily spear those bars of soap or icebergs that are floating in the water and plop them in a bag and off they went. You can see we also got a lot of trash involved. Uh, another reason that we were not able to use the vac trucks is you see a lot of solids, a lot of waste there. And this is typical for the Houston Ship Channel, which is a bayou fed by all the other bayous around the city of Houston. A lot of trash accumulates through the storm drains, the same way the beef tallow got in the water. These come in through the storm drains and things, and they end up floating down the channel. But in the top right there, you can see another gentleman using a pitchfork uh, to get some more stuff out. So they get it up on the dock, and uh, off it goes to the recycling plant uh, or to the landfill. So my question here is, do you have a flexible plan? My oil spill response plan, I'm like, finally, I got it. I, these, these guys went out and bought uh, four dozen pitchforks. Well, I didn't have that in my plan. One of the best stories I ever heard, I went to a conference one time and heard uh, Rudy Giuliani speak about the 9-11 incident. And the crux of his talk was, we didn't have a plan for a plane flying into the World Trade Center. But he said, you know what, we had 26 other emergency response plans on the shelf. And I knew that in one of those plans, we had a uh, mass casualty plan to deal with lots of injuries. He said, in another plan, I knew we had an evacuation plan where we could clear uh, lower Manhattan. In another plan, I, I, I had a section that talked about fighting a skyscraper fire. And so he said, what we had was different plans out there, and I knew there were sections in there. And as I pulled those different sections out of those other plans, I could create a plane flying into the World Trade Center disaster response plan. So is your plan flexible? Um, again, I'm not going to change my oil spill response plan to include pitchforks, but my plan was flexible enough that we could employ pitchforks if needed. Two more sections here. I'm going to take those vignettes now. I'm going to talk in general about the port coordination team. How do we reconstitute traffic or commerce on the water after we have an incident that shuts down the channel? And then I want to bring it all home with uh, five ways to really make a mess. But there's three questions after you have an incident on the water. Is the waterway ready? And the Army Corps goes out and does a survey, and then the Coast Guard makes a decision. Is the facility ready to receive? The waterway may be open. Your facility may not have power. But the biggest question we always get is who goes first. So the ship channel's been closed for a few days, and everybody wants to go first. After Hurricane Ike hit uh, Houston and Galveston, we had ships that had run away from the storm come back and prepare to deliver their cargoes to the Port of Houston. You can see them here at Anchorage uh, a couple days after the storm queuing up to come on in. Here's a, another shot, a uh, digital image from the Vessel Traffic Service that shows 152 ships at anchor off Galveston after seven days of fog. So all these ships want to come in, they're all on tight time schedules, and they're waiting for the fog to clear. Who goes first? If I asked you in this room today, and again, I'm not there with you live, but I said, who wants to go first? Every hand in the room would go up. So how do you solve that? A more recent incident, uh, the Texas City Y, we had an oil spill down there near Galveston, and oil went everywhere on the jetties and we had to restrict traffic for a few days in order to get the oil contained because the ships coming in would obviously cast a wake over this jetty that you see here and move the oil around and, and that wasn't going to work either. So the goals of the port coordination team are to communicate, communicate, and communicate. Number four is really the key though, uh, to move traffic with a purpose. So how do we prioritize the maritime traffic that gets the critical commodities to the facilities that need them? 
we stopped a ship one time uh, when I was captain of the port offshore for a uh, inspection before it came in, and I got the most angry call. Um, and, and people obviously don't like to have, be delayed. And I was told, because of you, there's going to be no diapers on the shelves at Walmart tomorrow. And I realized at that point what an impact um, delaying a ship had uh, on the commerce and, and the just-in-time delivery of things that are needed here in the Houston area. So how does it work? One of my favorite pictures ever. This is a uh, album cover from uh, the Moody Blues back in the day. We have representatives on the Port Coordination Team from all different segments of the maritime industry here in Houston. The Port of Houston Authority is represented, the ports of Freeport, Texas City, Galveston, um, oil refineries, they get together and they talk, chemical facilities, uh, oil terminals. We have the National Weather Service. We have Customs and Border Protection, who's responsible for clearing visas and cargo when they come in. All these different groups um, provide input to the port coordination team. And simply how it works is all these different groups that are out there, they get together. So let's say you're an oil terminal and there's eight of them in Houston. Those eight people talk together and they have one representative who then gets to talk to the port coordination team representing their interests. It's a great self-correcting system because if one of those eight terminals says, I need a ship tomorrow, the other guy can say, no, 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 I know your business. I know you got oil in the tank farm back on the back 40 there. You don't really need to go first. So if they start blowing smoke up each other's skirt, they know it and it's very self-correcting. And if the one person they pick to represent that group misrepresents the group, guess what? They're not going to be the uh, representative next time. So each one of those groups has an off-site meeting, determines their priorities, usually a teleconference, and then they call into the port coordination team representing their segment of industry. The port coordination team has an agenda or a sequence. We usually start with a roll call and then the weather service updates us. The Coast Guard gives us a state of the waterway. Where are we? What's the plan for reopening? When might we reopen? And then they go around the, on the table or around on the phone and each segment of industry puts in their priorities. Um, the first time I saw this in action, I'd been with the Coast Guard here in Houston uh, just about two months. And we had an oil spill, it was over in uh, Sabine, and the ship channel was closed for a week. Well, after that week's up, we're getting ready to open the ship channel again, and being the simple sailor I am, I'm thinking that this giant crude tanker out there, biggest ship out there, needs to go first. And my folks on the ground said, no, 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 that, that little tugboat over there with the one barge, he gets to go first. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? We have this huge tanker out there, and why would this little barge, little tugboat with one barge, uh, like the little engine that could, why would he go first? And they said, well, he's carrying a vital component um, and he, for making rubber, and he needs to go all the way up to the top of the channel, uh, up to the Goodyear plant up there, because he's got to get this there so they can make the rubber that goes into tires that are used in the war effort in Iraq. And I said, wow, I never in a million years would I have understood that unless we had this process in place where we hear the concerns of industry. And so the little tugboat, the little engine that could, led the parade, followed by these giant crude tankers, into uh, the Sabine waterway after the oil spill. And it was a lesson that has stuck with me to this day. All right, generic preparation, things to consider. So the top five reasons things go bad, an ineffective process. Uh, I would submit to you that the, the safety quest had an ineffective process. The captain was not paying attention to where he was going, not doing what he was on the bridge for. He was typing a report required by the company. Uh, in the case of the monkey, probably an ineffective process in how did the monkey get on the ship? Obviously there, there wasn't uh, security or there, there wasn't a, a way to ensure that uh, creatures like that didn't get on the ship when it was being loaded. Shortcuts to save time and money. Again, uh, great maritime photo there of some sailors working on something, but the safety quest could have had a second person on the bridge. They Instead, they tried to double up somebody who was already busy with a job in doing a second thing. So kind of a shortcut. Using the wrong tool. 
Well, in the tallow spill, a vacuum truck was the wrong tool. Um, not necessarily that we used it in this particular case, but we switched to pitchforks. So you have to make sure you have the right tool. The same thing with the uh, Occupy Houston. That tent was absolutely fabulous. I would have never considered a tent, but that was absolutely the right tool at the right time in the right place. Lack of preparation. Um, again, a lot of my plans did not have in them what I needed them to have in it, but I go back to Rudy Giuliani saying you had pieces of the puzzle in all your different plans. You needed to pull them out and be prepared. So look at your partnerships. Look at your plans. Are your plans flexible, and do you have the different pieces of the puzzle? And finally, a total lack of communication. Uh, the gentleman with the tallow spill who went out there to unbolt and inspect that tank, either he heard wrong or somebody told him wrong as to which tank it was. And uh, that obviously led to, led to a bad situation. My takeaway slide for you today, if you don't remember anything else, uh, this is the slide that's going to wrap it all together. This is out of the Coast Guard Incident Management Handbook, and it is our best response model. Each one of these five things um, occurs in a crisis, some to a greater extent or a lesser extent, depending on what the crisis is. I submit to you that for continuity or, or contingency planning or resilience or anything of that nature, you can use these five things in order to uh, guide what you do. Let's talk real quickly about the safety quest. Uh, it hit the power line. Health and safety concerns? Yes, that bar is important. Environmental? Probably not so. I didn't have any oil in the water. I didn't have any oil leaking from the barge. Economic impact? Huge concern in that case ship channels closed. Public communications, front page of the Houston Chronicle. Stakeholder involvement, we use the port coordination team to bring our stakeholders in to reopen the channel. The monkey, I had health and safety concerns because it had an infectious disease. No environmental concerns, no economic impact, the ship was anchored, no public communications on that one. We were simply talking to the CDC and no stakeholder involvement. So you can see in that one, the things that were important were a little bit different. Occupy Houston, health and safety of the protesters, no environmental concern. Economic impact, eh, the road was closed for about a half hour, and what they didn't know is we opened another gate uh, for the trucks to go through that they didn't know about, so really no economic impact. Public communications, very high in that one, but again, not much stakeholder involvement. And then lastly, the uh, tallow spill, health and safety, check. Environmental, yes. Economic impact, somewhat. It, it was in a part of the channel all the way near the head of the channel, so uh, it didn't cut off a lot of terminals. Public communications, people were interested, but not as interested as they would have been, let's say, in the Texas City Y oil spill. And stakeholder involvement, again, we use support coordination team to recover. Being a security specialist, I would uh, submit to you that if I rewrote the Coast Guard Incident Management Handbook today, I would add a, a sixth bar called security. And I want to urge you in your contingency plans that when something happens and you all run out the door to take care of that fire, that oil spill, that security incident, that you remember to lock the door when you leave because you don't know who's coming in behind you. What a great opportunity um, for a terrorist group or somebody else to create a diversion. Everybody runs that way as they run out to check on it, they leave the door open, and thing, bad things can happen back, back at home. So keep that in mind as well, but unfortunately I'm no longer in the Coast Guard and I'm not going to have a chance to rewrite the handbook anytime soon. <laughs> All right, I have uh, my contact information here. I know Fred's recording this and would be more than happy. He's going to post it online, so I'll leave that up for just a second there. But uh, I want to turn it back over to Michelle. Uh, for any questions you may have, and, and thank you uh, again for having me. Michelle? Thanks, and, and likewise, Captain. Really, it's, I, um, I'm sure I'm not alone here. I learned an awful lot in this presentation, and just your wealth of experience and the diversity of your experience at the local level and at the federal level. It's, um, it's, there are good takeaways from all of us. So here's what we have. Um, we have a small group of questions that have come in. I realized that I neglected to say early on, if you have a question about Captain Woodring's presentation, there's a chat 
feature on your GoToWebinar control panel that, that popped up when you joined the webinar today, just type it in there and we'll get it. And if we have time, we'll um, make sure these questions are asked. If for some reason we run out of time, because we do want to honor that commitment to you guys, um, then we will follow up with you after the webinar has concluded. And just also to reiterate, this has been recorded today and we'll post it on the Continuity Housing YouTube channel. Um, so if there are people that you know that would be interested in this, which I can't imagine anyone would not know someone, um, please feel free to forward the link once we send that out. Okay, so Captain, the first question, and this is a, I think this is a really good one. Um, you talked about a lot of different types of threats and we know that you have to cover a lot. The question is, what is the most serious threat to your operations overall? Right, and when I was captain of the port, I got that quite a bit, um, and I, I still get it here with the Port of Houston Authority. Um, probably something that closes down the ship channel is, is probably the biggest threat to commerce. Um, the biggest threat to people is probably the chemical plants and ships and barges that, that line the ship channel. We have some uh, you have sulfuric acid, you have chlorine, you have anhydrous ammonia. You have a lot of nasty chemicals that are used uh, in the refining process that give us a lot of the products that we enjoy every day. Um, but some of those chemicals are very dangerous, and when you have a ship channel that's in the heart of populated areas, you have to, you have to worry about that. Um, when, when people ask me, to rephrase the question, they say, what keeps you up at night? Um, knowing that we have an extremely high volume of traffic here in Houston, um, it, it's hard to sleep at night. You, you almost know something's going to happen, but on the other side of the coin, you know that you have the best responders in the world here in Houston because of all the chemicals and all the different things you have. So you have the response organization. So it's not a matter of, of if it happens, it's a matter of when it happens, but you're also backed and comforted and allows you to sleep at night by the fact that you have the best responders in the world right here in Houston. Great, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, this one just came in, and it says, do individual terminals have their own plans? And then there's a follow-up, if so, do they coordinate with PHA, with the, with the Port of Houston, I am responsible for uh, what are known as the facility security plans for our eight terminals. Uh, uh, post 9-11, the federal government passed the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002, and that requires each facility and each vessel to have a facility or vessel security plan that outlines their protective measures and their response measures. It also requires that each vessel have a vessel security officer. Each facility must have a facility security officer, somebody designated to oversee that plan and make sure that we comply with it. The Coast Guard comes out uh, and does an annual full-blown inspection and then two, three, four spot inspections, surprise inspections during the year of our security at the terminals. Um, the facility security officers for the Port of Houston Authority work for me, and we hold those plans for our eight terminals. All the other terminals out there, the other called 142 terminals out there, they each have their own facility security officer and their own individual plan that's filed with the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, there are things that are fairly common amongst the plans. Uh, access control, you have to vet the people, you have to screen the people to certain percentages that the Coast Guard gives you. Uh, you have to have a TWIC card, which is known as the Transportation Workers Identification Credential. It's a uh, kind of like a national ID card that you have to have, so that's in every plan. Um, what else would be in it? Oh, um, you have to have physical security uh, along your perimeter. And that can be a fence, it could be a wall, it could be a moat filled with alligators. They don't really specify, but most people have, have ended up with a fence like we do. Um, and so you have to outline all those things in your plan and submit that to the Coast Guard for approval. Then they come out and check. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. This next one <laughs> this is a bit of a wild card. We'll see how, how you answer. Uh, it, it says, what's the most interesting incident that's occurred since you became director? And I would just add, you know, I'm sure there are things you can't discuss. So what's the most interesting one that you can discuss? Um, 
the, the Occupy Houston since I've been here was uh, was very very interesting. Um, there are some other terrorism related ones, but uh, if you'll let me kind of break the question and go back to my Coast Guard days here in Houston shortly before I came over here, I'll, I can tell you a story. Um, we got a call again in the command center uh, from somebody from uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and uh, they said, hey, um, I, I need you to call this number for me and, and tell them I've got this certain isotope showing up on my meter. And our guys in the command center said, well, you're, you're from the NRC, why don't you just call them yourself? He said, well, I'm on a cell phone and I'm on a ship outside of Houston at Anchorage. And we said, well, that's not good. Um, he said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I rode the ship from South Carolina to Houston and we were just getting background readings with our Geiger counter so we can set kind of, you know, what the baseline is for meter readings and stuff for, for ships and cargo and things like that. And he says, but I'm getting this really strange reading. Would you, would you call this number for me? We said, sure. So we call the phone number and um, they call back and they said, yeah, the radiation reading that guy's getting is from Chernobyl. And I mean, took my breath away from it. I was like, you say what? From Chernobyl? Um, and in the couple days it followed, obviously this went all the way up to DC and back again, um, but over the course of the next couple days it was determined that the ship um, had a cargo in it that was on wooden pallets and the wooden pallets had been made from trees that had been downwind from Chernobyl. And some enterprising <laughs> Russians had gone out in the forest, cut the trees down, and made pallets that had the Chernobyl radiation signature on them. And so here these pallets are going around the world starting to set off alarms everywhere that they're infected with Chernobyl uh, radiation. So I, I thought that was a pretty neat story that had a good ending to it that I didn't have to worry about. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So the next one is about jurisdictional issues. It's uh, how do you handle jurisdictional issues relevant to local and federal law enforcement? Right. There's a lot of different pieces to that one. Um, the police force here at the Port of Houston Authority, they're all uh, certified Texas peace officers. So they have authority and jurisdiction just like everybody else does uh, who is a Texas peace officer. That doesn't mean they're going to go into one of the local cities like Pasadena or Deer Park and just start arresting people because obviously that's not the way law enforcement agencies cooperate. Um, so at the local level we, we cooperate with all the local jurisdictions up and down the ship channel. Um, on the state level there isn't a lot of uh, legislation or regulation for homeland security um, in the maritime realm, which, which is kind of surprising. There is some for petrochemicals and refineries and things like that, but we, uh, we don't have any terminals to support of Houston Authority that uh, handle bulk liquids uh, or chemicals like that. And then at the federal level, they're really the, the guide on or, or the lead um, with the Department of Homeland Security as to what the regulations will be. And those regulations uh, flow both through Customs and Border Protection, who are responsible for visa issues. So when a ship comes in, um, anybody getting on or off the ship has to clear customs. And any cargo, and this is a misnomer, a lot of people think the cargo is screened by the facility. The cargo is not screened by the facility, it's screened by Customs and Border Protection. And uh, every ship, every container that goes in and out passes through a radiation portal monitor and and uh, they have their procedures for checking all that cargo. So it's really a three-layered approach. It's federal, state, and local and we do exercises constantly um, at all levels, hosted by all levels or different levels that invite people from all the different levels. So um, the one thing about Houston is very collegial environment um, touted in several reports is, is having a network along the waterfront that is extremely well connected and a model for other ports to follow because we all know each other and we can pick up the phone in the middle of the night and call. That's great. Just a side question of my own, um, you know, what's the, what's the average tenure of somebody that's involved at that level? Have you guys been working together for a long time? Is that part of it? Well, you have to think that, that pre-9-11, um, all the security that was in place was really to prevent theft and it was to prevent things from getting out of the terminal. 
Um, post 9-11, it's trying to keep things from getting into the terminal. Um, so it's a little bit of a different mindset, but a lot of the uh, security people up and down the ship channel were either policemen in their past lives who kind of migrated over to Homeland Security after 9-11, uh, people like myself who were in the Coast Guard. And my job in the Coast Guard was safety, security, and stewardship of the environment. Um, so I was basically doing all those things uh, in the Coast Guard, and I'm doing them now here at the Port of Houston Authority. So um, great network, and again, Homeland Security has only been around for, for what, 10, 12, 14 years. So it's yeah, a fairly new field, fairly new field, but uh, everybody knows each other and gets along great. 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 Okay, I think we have time for, for just one more. Um, and there are a few others that have come in. So for those folks that have asked questions, we will send responses back to you. Um, the last one is, how does the U.S.'s current involvement in Syria and Iraq affect you? Just in your day-to-day -day job, <clears throat> if, if there are things that you can tell us, <laughs> um, how is that affecting you? Right, and that, that's a great question, a great current affairs question. Um, I was reading the Houston Chronicle this morning, and front page story uh, talks about what's going on, and, and I'll say generically, in, in the Middle East. Uh, we've been, we are plugged into uh, the intelligence network. We see reports from uh, the Houston Fusion Center and, and the FBI and the Coast Guard and the National Response Center, people like that, uh, state, uh, the State Fusion Center. So we see those reports, and, and what I can tell you in, in general, without getting too specific is that what we've done over in the Middle East and, and the fact that we're getting involved uh, offensively over there uh, obviously does not sit well with our enemies who um, may in turn retaliate. So while we're vigilant every single day, and, and there's a great saying that the uh, price of freedom is eternal vigilance, that uh, that's more true than ever today and, and so we've put the word out to our policemen and and to our security guards to to just be extra vigilant they, they always are but uh, keep an eye and there's programs in most cities around the country now called see something say something and if you see something you need to say something and a lot of sheriff's departments and police departments have apps for your phone now uh, suspicious activity reporting numbers is always 911 and uh, let them know what you see and then let them follow up and, and again you can sleep well at night. Great, great. That's a nice way to, to wrap this up. Um, as we do wrap it up, I, I want to thank all of the people attending today for being here and I'd also like to ask you to please take a few seconds, 20-30 seconds, to complete this survey that's going to pop up in just a moment. Doing that will really help us in providing you with even more productive and instructive webinars moving forward. Um, also, please let us know how we can help your organization by providing housing for your critical folks when you need it. For Captain Woodring and for Continuity Housing, I'm Michelle Lowther. Thank you all again, and I hope you have a wonderful week.